Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second sponsor talk of the ACF Web Conference 2022. We are struggling with the technical details here. Uh, Bogdan, is that OK? Or do you? Yeah, yeah, I okay. can, hear, can you hear me? Can you yes. see me? I okay. can hear you, I can see you perfectly. Excellent. Thank you very much. So today's talk is brought to us by LinkedIn, who I'm sure doesn't need any introduction. Uh, our speaker today will be Bogdan Arsintescu, and he will be backed up by Scott Mayer, who is uh, there, I think, yes, and will be uh, here to uh, answer your questions. You can ask your questions using the, the Q&A feature of Zoom. Uh, Bogdan, holds a PhD of the Technical University of Delft. He has been working on high-performance computing and graph algorithms in a number of different companies. Uh, he's now the Engineering Director for Graph Systems at LinkedIn. Uh, Scott is a software engineer with 15 years of experience in building graph databases, also in a number of companies. Uh, he's the creator of Liquid, the graph database built from the ground up at LinkedIn for powering their knowledge graph, the economic graph. And this is what they're going, well, what Bogdan is going to present to us. So don't hesitate, as I said, to ask your question uh, on, on the Q&A uh, feature of Zoom. And Bogdan, thanks for being here. This, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Pierre. And uh, I will start presenting. Hopefully this will uh, turn as expected. And if you do not see my entire screen with the presentation, please. Yes. Uh, okay, okay, excellent. Okay. So um, thank you so much, Pierre Antoine. Uh, I will talk today about um, a large scale application development at LinkedIn. Uh, using a graph database, we call it one query, one graph, and I will try to explain in the um, uh, following 30, 40 minutes um, what all these words mean and uh, how did we go about it. Um, LinkedIn, of course, uh, is um, um, building an economic graph. So the members, the companies, the schools, the skills that uh, these members have and the connections between all of this are forming the economic graph. Um, it is a large knowledge base. Um, that um, uh, allows its members and companies and recruiters to have a, a view in this uh, graph. So this is the one graph that we were talking about in the title. And the application is all the views that we have in this graph. So now I'm happy to introduce um, Scott. And this is my view of uh, Scott's um, graph neighborhood. So you see that we have uh, 198 mutual connection in the top right of the screen and a few people selected of that, the, the ones that are ranking higher. You see the current position in the top right and the um, uh, college and mutual groups and all of these um, uh, details are coming from the economic graph. So this is the application and there are other applications that LinkedIn build like recruiter views, like job views that um, uh, you all hopefully are um, taking advantage of. So what does this mean for a uh, graph database? Well, it means a graph of uh, 250 billion edges, uh, 1.6 million QPS, and um, it expects latencies in the tens of milliseconds or milliseconds. Um, I'm not trying to hide the details here. Each query takes a slightly different times. Uh, it's in general, we have a budget of uh, 30, 50, 70, 100 milliseconds. Most of the single lookups are in the single milliseconds. So how did we build this? What did we need to do? Um, LinkedIn is 20 years old this year, and it always had a version of a graph database. This particular project that we're talking about, Liquid, has started in 2014 and uh, it needed to scale to the current size of the um, uh, economic graph and to the future size of the economic graph. So we needed something that wasn't available in, um, uh, in, the, uh, 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 in the commercial space and we needed it to scale. So we started with that. So we scaled um, a number of things, and I will talk about the five more important um, uh, scale directions for the LinkedIn um, uh, graph serving system. 
So we needed to create a graph index that scales to hundreds of joins. And I know that it's graph and the joins are pre-materialized, uh, but we're trying to project this into the relational space and try to explain why the uh, relational solution did not work for us. So if you have a relational solution, then you have to query data from dozens of spaces, dozens of uh, stores, bring it into a middle tier, uh, create, uh, you know, run the joins, compute them in memory, provide a solution, and that, that, that one scale in, um, in the tens of milliseconds budget that we have. The second direction was we had to scale out with a distributed graph. There is no single machine, uh, or there wasn't in 2014, that can scale for the size of the graph that we need. And even right now, you know, a solution like that would be uh, prohibitive in cost. So a distributed system is much better for, for scaling and for future scaling. The third direction in which we had to grow was how do we enable uh, fast growth? How do we allow LinkedIn and the economic graph uh, engineers to add new data sets? How do we allow members to add new connections? How do we allow new features and new queries to be created in this graph? Uh, that's the fourth dimension. You know, we needed a, a query language that will support 5,000, 10,000 developers that are creating features that uh, our uh, 800 plus million members will benefit from. And last but not least, when you build a system like that, you need to be able to operate it uh, with something less than a thousand uh, systems engineers. So um, we wanted to simplify operations and be able to run this system with just a couple of dozen, spe uh, dozen people. So this is all the, um, uh, the, this is the agenda for today and this is what I'm gonna be trying to talk about. So how do we um, scale a graph index to tens of joins and hundreds of joins? We are using everything that works at scale concurrently. So how do we scale something in memory? Well, you have to make it look like pointers. So you have to start chasing pointers and reduce the latency such that um, uh, you, are, have, you have a system that ends up dealing with pointer. Graph databases in particular are random access. So you don't need the sorted storage. So our system is an in-memory um, uh, relational system based on hash storage. It's relational because it's easier to um, take advantage of the 50, 60 years of um, academic research in the domain. Um, relational algebra is very well understood. Um, the other thing that we needed to do was to create a weight-free data structure uh, or use a weight-free uh, data structure to, um, uh, to avoid locks and um, contention and concurrency problems. Um, and we design it using a single writer shared memory solution. So the writer has, uh, is pinned to a single CPU and there's a single writer. So that's how we uh, handle serialization. And the readers are taking a read-only, um, uh, they, they are using the, uh, the database in read-only mode. Um, and there, there is a schema to make sure that there is no contention that we're not um, uh, uh, surfacing in process writes. Um, the writers um, are, uh, have process isolation. So if a writer gets out of memory and, and cannot complete a query, that process uh, dies, takes the uh, memory with it, but it leaves the um, uh, database intact and uh, all the other writers can still have access to the database as, um, uh, uh, as intended. Uh, we have uh, each of the writer is pinned to a core, so the number of parallel uh, writes that we have is the number of, core, of CPUs that we have in the system. And what we observed using this system is that our memory bandwidth scales linearly in throughput up to uh, 50 plus cores, which is our current hardware uh, footprint. So if we want to change the ratio between uh, reads and writes, we will use a different um, uh, type of uh, machine with different uh, number of processors uh, to be able to scale to the kind of uh, throughput and the workload that we have. Our workload currently is, um, as you can imagine, is a global view of the graph. So it's very read heavy. Uh, the writes are just what the databases are, um, are sending as change feed 
from changes in uh, connections, changes in jobs, uh, but it's not a high volume um, update of the uh, index. Another dimension in, uh, in how did we scale the index is we're using a log structure. So we have a serialized graph. It's very easy to append um, uh, new data to the end of the graph. It's very easy to control that uh, single writer, multiple readers uh, uh, concurrency model. Um, we have branches that allow us to do what if queries and allow us to have a distributed system that are using these branches and what if queries. Uh, the log system also allows us to um, do point in time queries. So we can do queries as of a certain um, uh, point in the past. And that also helps us with um, doing uh, session consistency. So when you get a, a read and you, you're giving the log with um, read only mode to a given uh, reader, then the writer can still append uh, data to the log and uh, those details will not be seen by the current query. So how do we scale on that? Currently, um, our system scales to have 1.5 terabytes of RAM uh, graph shards. There is no mistake there. It's 1.5 terabyte of RAM per each machine that we have in, um, uh, in production. And I saw uh, Scott uh, smiling on that. So yes, uh, we <laughs> mission accomplished. The second dimension of, uh, of scaling is uh, how do we scale out with a um, distributed graph? So of course, you know, when you have 1.5 terabyte of graph uh, of RAM in, uh, in each shard, and when you have uh, 250 billion edges, you cannot fit it all in one memory. So our solution for building a distributed system was to take a set of computers, let's say a rack in the data center, and treat it as a single computer. So that's our aim in, um, in dealing with the distributed system is to, um, uh, to have a, a hypercomputer, um, which is a cluster for us, a single replica of the graph and deal with it that way. So let me give you the details. So one graph is composed of multiple shards. And um, uh, in this distributed cluster, in this graph replica, you can see the, the vertical axis is the read path, the queries that are coming to um, uh, brokers. Brokers are exactly the same database structure, except they don't store data. They are a um, stateless system. And uh, the brokers are querying the, um, the different slices of the graph. And uh, you can see that some slices fewer than, uh, uh, than what I pictured here, uh, do not have arrows for them. So some slices just exist in the cluster to be able to repair the clusters. I'll talk a, uh, uh, a little bit later about this. So the model for this um, distributed system is eventual consistency. Each shard uh, is updated independently. Of course, all shards are consuming the data in the same order. Uh, but we don't have um, a uh, session consistency at this moment because our application did not need it. Um, the way we distribute the, um, uh, the, the data in the shards is uh, hash based. Each edge exists in two places. It exists in the shard that owns the subject of the, um, uh, of the triple that we have in the graph uh, of the edge. Um, and it exists in the um, shard that owns the object of um, that uh, place. Of course, you know, a few of them exist in the same shard because both the, uh, the subject and the object are hashed in the same place. We are not using this schema for um, availability, for reliability. So it doesn't matter for us if, uh, um, if, the, if the shard is not in two places. So how does this scale? So right now we have a graph um, that scales to um, 250 billion edges. If you had seen the um, uh, slides yesterday, the number was 230 billion edges. It doesn't scale uh, 20 billion edges per day, uh, but it's scaled uh, from about 150 billion edges last year when we were fully in production to this year to 200 billion edges. We're very comfortable scaling the footprint of um, of the database to accommodate new data sets that are coming in. So we think we can scale it to a 2x, 4x from this point without any uh, additional engineering needed. Oops. 
So how do we use this um, uh, hypercomputer or these uh, replicas of graphs to achieve high, high availability? Uh, this is the standard trick of replication. Um, if, you, if one graph is uh, uh, damaged, then you need replicas to take that load. We have um, um, load balancing on top of um, the system to be able to um, uh, address how the uh, uh, queries are distributed uh, across these replicas. Um, and what I show in the picture on the right hand side is if one shard dies, um, if one machine is uh, defective, then one of the spare machines that we have in the clusters uh, takes its place. So it morphs to become that particular um, uh, shard. How do we achieve this? Periodically, we're taking snapshots of the entire um, database. So each shard writes to disk the current content of the log and its indices. And that one is copied over to, um, to a location. And so, for example, if we have 10 replicas, then we will have 10 snapshots available at different points in time, um, all of them not older than X hours. X is generally two or three hours. When a shard um, uh, is damaged, another machine of the same shape and size is taking its place and it, it says, I need the, um, uh, the data for shard eight. And if there's anybody in the uh, you know, in audience from Google, they know what attributes is associated with shard eight. Um, so um, we repair the cluster, we bring it up, we catch up with the change feed uh, that takes a few minutes. And then we put the cluster back in production. The number of um, spares that we have in each cluster is about 10% of the number of shards that we have in, um, uh, in production. So it's not a full replication, it's just a, a percent of the replication. And because we have uh, multi-zone deployment in, um, uh, in three data centers and we have spare replicas, um, that are spare capacity in the replicas enough for the planned and unplanned repairs, we achieved 99.99% uh, .99 availability, four nines availability in the first week of our production. We kept it that way for the last 18 months. Um, people are asking, you know, how can you achieve four nines? The difference between four, four nines and five nines is generally cost. Um, we are comfortable with the current uh, footprint um, if LinkedIn has worked for you in the last year and a half, then it means that we had four nines availability and uh, uh, we could we can recover faster. We, uh, we have plans on, uh, on going to five nines if commercial um, applications require it. The next direction in which we are uh, uh, growing is how do we add new data fast? So our economic graph uh, is, th this graph index is just an index. The source of truth is elsewhere. And we have seen this uh, pattern in um, uh, all the graph applications that we've seen um, uh, in recent past. Um, people are storing, you know, companies are storing their data in sources of truth and they, they need a global view over uh, a number of silos. And they create this graph index for, um, for the purpose of serving an application, but the data is stored elsewhere. So when you have these silos, what you need is uh, to bring all the data in the graph. And that's, the, um, um, the, the, that's what the picture is trying to show. Uh, in order to solve this problem, we have um, defined a declarative transformation model. Um, so the language that we're using for graph query, we're using for graph transformation for getting the data from the input sources and transforming it into edges and writing it into the graph. Um, our system allow constant time schema evolution. So once you define a predicate in one uh, write, in the next write, you can actually use it to create edges on it. So if you want to add another silo, so let's pick on the yellow silo that um, wasn't part of the graph, you add the schema. Uh, for that silo through uh, constant time schema evolution, you write the queries that are necessary for that, you write the transformation and you can start ingesting the data and the yellow nodes will start popping up in the, in the graph. 
Um, the detail here is that the, um, uh, the silos that we are ingesting have this joint data. So concurrency and, uh, and ordering and serialization is easy for us because our, uh, our silos have this, are disjoint. So edges about member to member connections um, are coming only from one store. They're not coming from multiple stores. So we don't have to deal with, um, uh, with out of order um, uh, rights. So that's our schema for adding uh, new data sets uh, easily. In the last 18 months since we had the system in production, we have added new data sets pretty much every few weeks. Um, we are striving to get to a point where we can add a new data set within hours. So when your client comes in, um, has an idea of how to experiment, we are planning to shrink that, uh, that time from currently days to get to query their data set to hours to be able to uh, to use that now going back to branches you can imagine how we could use branches in the future to allow experimentation in a branch so a new client comes in we create a branch for their data we write the data in that branch we persist it uh, we can use it later uh, this is a an area in which we're we're considering expanding our uh, engineering so we have a graph, we can serve it, we can grow it, we can add data sets fast, uh, we know how to scale all that. How do you scale the development? How do you add and modify queries fast? So for that one, um, we, have, uh, 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 we have adapted an existing language that is uh, relational and it is well known in studies. Um, we adapted data log for our uh, needs. Again, we have constant time schema evolution in the system. So once you declare a query in data log, you can start using it right away. Once you declare a predicate, you can write uh, edges on that predicate. You can query data on the predicate. Um, new data sets can be appended to an existing easy, very easily using data log. Again, we're using data log for transformation, for writing data in the graph, and we're using data log for querying data from the graph. Our data model is edges. So the basic ingredient of the graph is triples. You want to add an edge that says that member two, I'm not member two, I'm probably in the hundreds of, uh, in the 500 million uh, uh, number, you know, my ID. Um, if you, add, if you want to add that edge, you simply declare the edge and the subject, the predicate object, the predicate is name, the object is Bogdan, uh, you add another member called George, and then you can query uh, for edges, X, name, Y, you know, query all the predicates, um, uh, qu query all the edges with predicate name in the graph. You can get uh, uh, both data back, assuming that these are the first triples that I wrote in uh, in the graph. So this is how simple it is to use um, uh, our version of uh, of the data of data log that we implemented for the graph. Why is data log useful? Is because it's relational. So we have the relational guarantees that um, SQL has in a graph database, and that's uh, unique in our um, uh, in our solution. What else is data log bringing to uh, to us? Well, it gives um, it brings uh, every developer dreams. It brings composable rules. So a good developer will break their code into functions and will use these functions to compose a, a software and increase the um, uh, the level of uh, complexity and uh, um, uh, using composition. Uh, we're providing the same thing for our users using. Um, um, uh, data log uh, rules, uh, aka functions, if you are in a functional language. So you see here in the top of the slide how um, uh, you know the, the most simplistic uh, member definition that you have. You have the edge that defines the ID, the name, uh, predicate, and the name of the member, and the join date. And then you can query that um, uh, that member ID, and um, you will see that. Um, uh, I don't think I joined in 1995, so this don't don't assume that the return data is correct. It's just created for the purposes of this presentation. And uh, if you are an airline, then you want to segment your members into regular members and um, uh, gold members. 
And if this conference would be in person, you would all be painfully aware that you're not gold members or you would be very happy that you are gold members because you would sit in a, in a seat that actually can accommodate the size of a human being. So if you want to compose uh, rules for the graph database uh, to show gold members, then you take the existing rule, the member, and you just add another edge to it um, where uh, you add the status of that member uh, gold. And you can see here that uh, you know the, uh, the um, data log 101 for those that haven't seen data log before, um, a period at the end of the alpha statement means that you're writing data, a question mark at the end of the statement means that you're querying data. The other thing that we've added to, um, uh, to our database, everybody that has worked with um, um, triple stores says, hey, how about an array relationship? How about relationships that are more complex than, uh, than subject predicate object? How do you model uh, you know, uh, time series uh, data or time mediated data? Uh, probably the, the best example is uh, marriage or membership. So it's a relationship between person A, person B that has a start date um, in case of uh, employment, for example. Um, you have people coming and going to the same company. So you, you would like to be able to distinguish between uh, the first stint of person A at company B and the second stint that started in, let's say, 2005 and the second time when this person was employed by company B in 2015. So you need an NRE relationship to define that. Uh, the way we do this is by, um, uh, by defining a collection of edges, which is just a struct, and we can compose these structs into even more complex NRE relationship. Some of the um, uh, nodes, some of the edges in this relationship are defining the identity of that relationship. Um, so, for example, for a job, um, the start date is a necessary ingredient. The person A and the company B are necessary ingredients to define the identity of that relationship. But the end date is not a necessary relationship of that um, uh, relationship. So those are, you know, the three of the, uh, uh, of the edges are identity giving and the fourth one is not. So, you know, the, if you think in terms of uh, labeled property graphs, then um, uh, you created identity on the edge, you can assign, you know, you can add properties on this edge, um, which is the NRA relationship, and you can continue adding attributes. So the data model that we have can be adapted to um, either triple stores uh, or RDF graphs or property uh, uh, graphs. Um, uh, and uh, it can it can accommodate uh, uh, both. We value the fact that um, uh, we have all the data indexed, so you don't have to choose uh, whether one, 1980 is um, an interesting property for you, and you will later decide to join on 1980 or 1984 when you created the database. For, for our solution, you always can query and you always can, um, uh, can start from any node and start traversing the graph. Everything is an edge. So we have a graph. It scales in uh, footprint. It scales in QPS. It is highly available. Um, the other thing that we needed to do is how do we simplify operations? Um, we, um, uh, LinkedIn is um, uh, running a Strapi infrastructure um, uh, solution, so we cannot have the luxury of uh, uh, hiring hundreds of people to maintain this database. So in order to run this, we had to simplify operations as well. So we have, uh, uh, this is where the, uh, the angry slide with automate everything should, uh, should be, I didn't find the visual. Um, so we um, automated uh, throughput management. So when um, we uh, create a new version of the software and we, we put it in production, we thoroughly test whether the current version will have, will accommodate the same throughput or larger than the previous version of the software. That is an automated system that whenever we deploy um, code in production, test the database, make sure that it can handle the query workload, um, uh, 
uh, and then propagates it through production. We have a state machine controller, and the state machine controller is um, uh, managing the operation in an entire data center. So one of the, um, uh, the clusters in, uh, in the data center is creating an image snapshot and is building that. The state controller um, handles the image that is being created. It helps the, um, uh, the entire system to propagate those images uh, to, uh, to the replicas. Whenever a replica is damaged, the entire cluster is down for repair. Uh, the state controller finds uh, spare nodes. It finds the uh, snapshot of the image that it needs to, uh, to create, and the system self-repairs. So the state controller takes care of that as well. Um, it creates uh, tickets for the data center um, analysts to know which machines to repair, which uh, RAM um, to, uh, to swap, which disks to fix, and so on and so forth. Um, we also have an automated image and snapshot lifecycle. So I was telling earlier that the way to achieve high availability is to have uh, spare machines and take snapshots. So our uh, system is taking regular snapshots from all or most of the clusters, uh, and it's copying them uh, into safe location. We have um, uh, uh, replication of those snapshots. They are reusable in any cluster, in, in any peer replica in the system. Um, we're doing, we have another system that is doing continuous correctness checks. So we are querying the source of truth, we are querying the data in the index, we're comparing them using a graph database, of course, and we're trying to make sure that um, uh, the data that we have in the index is correct with respect to the source of truth. Uh, this is especially useful when sources of truth are adding new schema. Uh, we want to make sure that they are updating the, uh, the index to uh, propagate the schema further and don't forget about it or don't damage the data that is in production by, um, by having incompatible data flowing into the graph index. And of course, last but not least, is we have continuous utilization metrics. These are the things that, that um, uh, told me that we have 250 billion edges and 1.6 million QPS in production. So this system is in production for about 18 months. Um, if you are bringing up the, um, uh, your LinkedIn application or website and you start using it, um, uh, a lot of the data that you see in, um, uh, in the application is coming from this system. Um, and no matter how much uh, you try to reload, that's not going to affect it. Um, it's just going to make our day and it's going to make us happy that we could build this system for um, all the LinkedIn users. So in summary, um, I will talk today about the graph index system that we build uh, at LinkedIn. Um, we started building it in 2014. We put it in production um, uh, completely in 2020. Um, and um, um, we chose to go on this path because there was no commercially available um, uh, graph index system at that time or maybe even at this time that can scale to, the, to our needs. Uh, we use this system to build a global graph view. We index uh, heterogeneous data as a homogeneous graph with hundreds of billions of edges. Uh, we currently have 250 billion of edges. We think we can scale to probably a trillion edges with this system without any um, uh, particular problems. Um, we built this system because we wanted LinkedIn application development mo model to build one query applications. So in our vision, um, every page in LinkedIn should be able to be built with one single query, which is querying this economic graph, this one graph. And it should do that with declarative query languages, where the writer doesn't care about how the query is executed, but it just specifies what is the data that they want back. And then the database uh, takes care of optimizing the query plan execution, handles the data, re returns only the necessary data to the caller. Uh, the other thing that one query applications benefit from in, uh, in our case is the composable queries with dozens and hundreds of joins. 
So when you are um, coming into the environment and you want to write a query that says, tell me the members that have been to this school in this range of years, you should be able to benefit from the query that, that says, tell me the members that went to the school and then join it, you know, compo compose it with another query that is doing filtering by year range and so on and so forth. And this is the, uh, the stage of development that we are at right now. We want to scale uh, the application to million of QPS and we achieve that through uh, multiple replicas and multi-zone development. And um, uh, we showed how we serve this thing with uh, four nines um, availability. And uh, last but not least, um, this work has been um, uh, has been done at LinkedIn, and we have a new initiative that is called the LinkedIn Systems Lab. Uh, this um, uh, is an infrastructure um, environment where we design, develop, and evaluate novel technologies in the areas of distributed systems and yes, wink, wink, graph systems, uh, high performance computing, databases. We focus on identifying and applying the most innovative ideas of LinkedIn um, in, uh, and engage with the academic and research community to apply research to practical problems that we see in production. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, let's, uh... Let's give a virtual round of applause to our speaker. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any question in the Q&A system, so people don't be shy, go ahead. Uh, I have, uh, have a few questions myself. Uh, so data log as a query language for graphs is an interesting uh, and, and, and qu quite surprising uh, choice. Uh, I was wondering, uh, so, uh, if I understand correctly, the 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 the, the users building application uh, have to use that query language. Did you get any requirements for other, maybe uh, more usual query languages for graphs like uh, Cypher or Sparkle? And and uh, so, is is there uh, are there plans to support those other query languages? We have plans of supporting other query languages. Um, uh, there is an initiative within LinkedIn that uh, that is considering GraphQL for the kind of workload that we started with. GraphQL was not expressive enough to uh, to handle graph shaped queries, right? So don't don't be fooled about graph and GraphQL. <laughs> um, the uh, so we we chose data log because it is expressive for the relational workload that we had. One of one of the things that we had to um, uh, to solve was reachability between one user and, and another. So we were we needed to express a path. Um, we will, as we mature and, and we figure out where do we take the system and, and what are the next applications, we have plans on supporting languages uh, that are beneficial to the set of clients that we have. At this very moment, we have a single client, right? So we have LinkedIn as, um, as the, the, the client for this database and the application development that LinkedIn is fine with the current version of Datalog. We have a SQL translator because we, we had an intern um, uh, uh, working on a SQL translator. So yes, we, we have worked on, uh, on that. Um, uh, it, it is on, you know, it's, it's applied research, right? So for us, it was whatever was needed to get to carry us further and put the system in production. Okay, and I, I, so I see I see a few questions popping popping up on the on the Q and A system, and Scott's answering them promptly. Thank you very much. Uh, so there was a question about the expressivity of uh, of the language uh, about the, the release as as open source. Um, and uh, Juan Segueda is asking, so why no recursion, no use case right now, or is it too hard of a problem? Um, we have uh, so so. What I described was the distributed system, and, and I wanted to be clear about uh, the, the nuances, the, the nuanced differences between the, the single system and the, the single node system and the distributed system. Um, we currently do not have an implementation of uh, recursive data log in the distributed system that is efficient. So people that are aware of data log research, 
they will know that uh, data log and prolog evaluators uh, implement recursion, uh, which is something that is affectionately called boil the ocean. Uh, so uh, what it does, it takes the entire graph, it applies the constraints it needs, uh, and it gives you the rest of the results. In a system that is distributed and has uh, 250 uh, uh, billion edges, you cannot do that because it's inefficient. Um, so the way we handle um, the recursive application right now is we try to discover the bounds. We have a very limited um, uh, set of time and we do it with the with this junction. So we we expand the query to um, to handle the disjunction and we and that is efficient for um, for us in the current system. In the single node system, we have an implementation of recursion. Um, we do not have any commercial application of recursion right now in production. Okay, thanks. Um, well, st still related to, to, to queries and query languages, um, you, you introduced the, 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 the question by comparing it with uh, the relational model and expressing this in terms of joints um, for reasons that you made very clear. I was wondering whether this architecture and the, the choices of, 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 the, of the query language uh prevents you from uh, uh prevents the system from efficiently solving traversal based queries and so if uh implementing gremlin for example or something similar would be possible or harder i don't think it will change much uh, so this is these are traversal based queries Right, so they they are not algorithmic queries, so you, you don't uh, you know you don't get efficiencies uh, by doing analytics from this system. It's built for uh, operational workloads. Um, but things that you see in your profile, right? So triangle closing queries that you see right now in your LinkedIn profiles are coming from this system. So you can do traversal efficiently. Um, I would argue because the language is is declarative, you can actually implement more efficient traversal than, uh, than Gremlin could do by just naively traversing uh, imperatively, you know, that's not, uh, you know, I, I don't want to add an attribute that means something else. Um, and um, uh, you can do traversal based queries uh, in, uh, uh, in the system. Okay, thanks. Uh, no more, no more questions on the Q&A or at least I no more than Scott left left unanswered. Uh, well, I guess there's something that I have to ask. Um, so you, you describe a very atomic and, and uh, graph model and you explain how, uh, especially this pattern about anary relations allows you to uh, express things that, that would be found in property graphs or RDF. Uh, what about edge metadata? Uh, uh, as as you might know, I've been personally involved in the RDF star effort, and so to <laughs> that that's a, a question dear to my to my heart. So has the the use case ever been raised, and how how would you uh, handle that in this uh, this model? I. I'm going to I'm going to claim ignorance and and ask Scott to see if he has uh, I I don't think we have looked we, of course you know with the NRE model we can reify edges and we can add properties on uh, on edges uh, but we don't have any practical application right now of um, um, of using this for uh, provenance or uh, uh, and of course you know our, our uh, ACL model is not based on um, operationalizing provenance. So provenance is, is dealt with outside the graph nor inside the graph. Uh, Scott? Uh, hopefully uh, you can hear me and we're not getting yes. terrible feedback. Okay, good. Uh, so there are two possible things uh, when you talk about edge meta metadata. There's data about edges generally. And uh, or SPNO triples, we do not uh, support that. The triple is by value purely. Um, so you can't refer to a particular instance of a triple. Um, and, and then the other kind of edge metadata is uh, um, data about a predicate, um, which tells you uh, what are the uh, type and cardinality constraints of the predicate, right? 
So the, uh, the cardinality constraints are obvious. Is it uh, uh, limited to one, two, n, or unlimited uh, on each side? And then the type constraints are, what does the scalar um, string have to parse as? So if you say something is an integer, what it means is uh, the string uh, that this thing points to must be parsable as an int. Um, and obviously, we do uh, we do the usual uh, uh, packing of uh, uh, smaller ints into sixty four bit offsets. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I, we are we've reached the end of the slots. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, there was a question from Lionel Medini, but uh, maybe uh, if if there or maybe very quickly, is there or will be an API available for Liquid? Um, to, for LinkedIn, probably not. Uh, the uh, LinkedIn is guarding the, um, uh, the the user's data very carefully. So, I, uh, you know, an API for Liquid will uh, public API for for the production version of uh, Liquid means that uh, we are giving people access to other people's data. So, no, that uh, that will not happen. Uh, is there going to be uh, uh, an open source version of Liquid that people can use and use data log? Probably. Okay. Uh, well, this is uh, this is the end of the session. Thanks a lot to both of you for this uh, very uh, interesting and inspiring uh, presentation. Looking forward to see more. Thanks everyone for attending. This is now the end of the second day of the, the web conference. I'll see you tomorrow, 8.30 uh, Lyon time uh, for, for the next sessions. Bye-bye and enjoy your Thank you so much. evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. Thanks again. Bye-bye.